go ahead and get started and jump in with my little normalcy story. So my name is Tanya Short. I'm the Health and Human Sciences Educator um, with Purdue Extension in Knox County, which is Vincennes down in the Southwest area. If you happen to be um, hailing from a different part of the state or from the country. Um, so I thought I was getting back to normal. My, my son was back in preschool. I was in the office. Hours were pretty normal. And I get a text last night about 6 p.m. saying there's been some potential exposure at daycare. So it's closed for further notice. So I'm back at home trying to figure that all back out again. Went to the office speed trip this morning before everyone else came in to collect all my things and then come back home and get set up and Luckily, um, grandma was available for a couple of hours during this time frame to help me corral the little one um, while we talk a little bit. So, um, um, well, first, I just want to make sure um, there's many folks who are not aware of Cooperative Extension. We are actually a nationwide organization that exists in every state um, doing research, education, and outreach. And so in Indiana, that is Purdue University. And on the next slide, um, is just to show that we do have county-based offices in every county in the state, which is kind of unique um, to Indiana a little bit. Some other states have gone to a more regional model, but you will find an office in every county in Indiana um, with individuals who are focused in one of those four areas listed there. And Joe and I, of course, are with Health and Human Sciences. And so um, thank you for joining us today. Um, one last housekeeping thing on the next slide is just to say that we are funded by a variety of different ways. Um, and one of the ways that we tell our story to our funders is through the evaluation or the feedback that we get when we do these types of programs. So at the end, um, I will be sharing a link with you and it would be really helpful, um, not only for this reason, but just also so we understand what went well, what you liked, what we could have done better for next time in getting your feedback to us. So today we are going to be looking at common causes of chronic tiredness. Hopefully you will be able to identify some reasons why you are so tired and then walk away with at least one action item. So if you are able and you have um, a pen and paper within reach, I would ask you to grab that and at the top write down why am I so tired? So I'm going to assume that this is a question that you've asked yourself or you wouldn't be here today. So as we go through today, I hope that you can take some notes from the different topics that we talk about um, and maybe be able to identify something that can help you. And so um, in the next slide with this lovely sleepy doggy, which some of us probably wish we could be joining, I want to ask you um, in the chat box, or you can unmute and share, what do you think is the top cause of chronic tiredness? Lack of sleep. Lack of sleep. Uh-huh, and that's what Michael said also in the chat. Stress. Stress, mm-hmm. Oh, yeah, we've got several of those votes in the chat box. I would say nutrition, your diet. Yes. Bad diet, being overwhelmed. I'm reading in the chat box. Lack of quality sleep. That quality is such an important word, right? Yes, it is. <laughs> Time management. Man, and isn't that gotten um, incrementally harder in the last six months? So you are all of you are actually right on cue. So on the next slide, um, I have a whole list, and this is not necessarily exhaustive, but these are kind of the top ones um, of things that can cause us to feel kind of chronically tired. And I used the cobweb kind of um, imagery there because these, these topic areas are intricately interwoven into where we can't necessarily impact one without impacting the other, and that goes both ways. So if we impact one positively, we might be impacting another positively, but vice versa for some of those compounding negative consequences. And so um, to start us off, we are gonna talk a little bit about nutrition. So what are we eating and drinking? 
And this is from a couple of different ways. So we can think about vitamin or mineral deficiencies, uh, our caffeine or sugar intake, and as well as um, alcohol. And then if we are just eating the right amounts. So we'll, in these next slides, we're going to dig into each of these a little bit more deeply. So um, in the chat box, I would be interested to know if you have dieted in the past year, and if so, what diet plan did you follow? Or you can unmute and share. So Weight Watchers, we got a few votes for that. Intermittent Fasting, South Beach Diet. Low sodium. Portion control, exercise, vegetarian. So food is something we think about a lot, right? Obviously, we need it every day, multiple times a day. Um, but the way we um, approach it can affect how we feel um, as far as our energy levels. So a variety of vitamins and minerals Things like iron, copper, magnesium, potassium, our B vitamins, vitamin E, they're all involved in red blood cell production and oxygen transport and our energy metabolism, as well as how well our body does or doesn't use the glucose or the blood sugar that we have in our body at that cellular level. So any deficiency can lead to feelings of lethargy, mental sluggishness, but here's the question, are we really at risk for a vitamin deficiency? If you eat a reasonably balanced diet, and I, and I highlight reasonable here because we all have our days, right? But if we make an honest effort that we're getting a well-rounded diet, the, the chances of that vitamin deficiency are very, very low. Now the caveats there are if we have underlying health conditions that can affect our nutrient absorption um, or maybe medications that can interfere with our nutrient absorption or if we're following um, diet fads or diet trends that tend to be incredibly restrictive in one food group or another. Um, so we need to keep in mind that the body does have a store of some vitamins and minerals while others are used rapidly and flushed easily out of the body and need frequently replenishing, meaning that even a short-term diet restriction can cause a vitamin or mineral imbalance. Um, and this would include even strict vegetarians or vegans um, who need to be really diligent to consume nutrients that may be lacking in their diet. So if we think about, um, so the answer there is that we want to think about focusing on a variety of healthy food from all our food groups and that if for some reason we do need to for health reasons or we choose to for preference reasons to restrict our, um, our diet, that we're making sure we've done the due diligence and education to make sure that we're not inadvertently um, causing that vitamin or mineral deficiency. And so next, I have a question. So first of all, I love my coffee. The next slide, we're gonna talk about coffee. Did you know that a cup of coffee is only considered six ounces? I mean, in my world, a cup is at least eight ounces, right? I feel like I'm getting gypped off a little bit. But nevertheless, how many cups of coffee or other caffeinated um, drinks would you say that you consume in a day? Okay. So in the chat, I'm seeing anywhere from none to six. Gara says too many, right? Two, two, one to two, five. Okay. <laughs> so um, caffeine should be limited to about three to 400 milligrams a day, and that's about three cups of coffee. Now, remember, a cup somehow of coffee is only six ounces, so an 18-ounce mug if you have an 18 ounce travel mug, that is your quota for the day for caffeine. Um, and while coffee has many potential positive effects, such as being an antioxidant, giving you a temporary energy boost, positive negative effects can also occur. 
It can lead to increased gastric production, giving you upset stomach or acid indigestion. It can also lead to headaches, lack of energy, irregular heartbeat, especially at higher doses. Um, and this is especially a real risk with energy drinks that are super concentrated. Um, so relative to our topic of tiredness here, though, is that decreased energy can come from both direct and indirect effects with caffeine. Um, for example, adenosine, which is a chemical that regulates our sleep-wake cycle, gradually um, is produced in the brain throughout, a day, throughout the day, gradually builds up, making us sleepy towards the end of the day. Um, caffeine, what it does is it actually blocks the adenosine receptors in our brain. And so our brain, our body is still producing this chemical all day long, but the caffeine is blocking it from reaching where it needs to go. So once that caffeine wears off, that adenosine attacks your brain, so to speak, all of a sudden, all at once, which is why we kind of get that, um, that crash when the caffeine wears off. Um, coffee is also a mild diuretic, which means that it increases um, the technical way I wrote this in my notes, our water excretion from our kidneys. So we're going to be going to the bathroom more often. And dehydration, even mild dehydration, can make us feel tired. Um, um, caffeine also constricts our blood vessels, which is why it can help with a headache. Um, but that altered blood flow when a chronic can lead to sluggish feelings also. So we also need to keep in mind that some medications even will contain caffeine. So we need to make sure um, that we are monitoring all sources of caffeine in our daily um, diet. And so here's the little P test for you to check if you're dehydrated. If it's darker than just a mild lemony yellow, I want you to drink a little bit more water, please. Um, and so lastly with that, we, so the answer there, we just wanna be careful of our caffeine consumption, especially afternoon um, because um, not only does it cause that afternoon crash when we've had too much, it also can prevent us from sleeping fully at night when we talked back about that quality sleep, right? So another question for you. When you're feeling sluggish and you're having that caffeine crash in the middle of the afternoon, what is your go-to snack? If it's one of these on the screen here, or let me rephrase that. If it was one of those um, tasty treats that were just flashing up on the screen there, we can go back to that, Joe. Um, how tempted would you be to grab one of those? Oh, we have, we have some folks on the line today with high restraint. Nobody is confessing that they would grab that cupcake. Good for you guys. When we are feeling sluggish, though, however, we are... Um, we're really tempted to grab these, right? Especially if they're within reach. Um, but it can have that immediate kind of pick us, pick me up kind of effect. But then again, just like when the caffeine wears off, when that sugar wears off, it leaves us in that slump. And so we need to think about rethinking our, our snacks and, uh, um, and meals so that we're not getting this highly refined sugar, high carb intake, um, that causes us to have that, that crash. And so we want to focus on whole foods, fruits and vegetables for our afternoon snack. Um, and, and, and better yet with that, even asking ourselves if we're truly hungry. So mild dehydration can sometimes mask itself as hunger. So maybe you just really need um, some water. Maybe you're a little bored or anxious, so you need to uh, getting up and, and going for a short walk, changing your scenery, getting a walk around can help you um, get through kind of that craving in the moment. And so speaking of drinks, um, the next topic I had on my category was alcohol. So while alcohol can help us fall asleep, it actually disrupts deep REM sleep, making you more likely to wake up during the night, which again, going back to that comment earlier about the quality sleep. Alcohol again is also a diuretic, making increasing the likelihood of dehydration and its sluggish side effects. 
And lastly, alcohol abuse can actually cause a vitamin B1 deficiency. So there, it's hitting you from multiple angles there. So the answer is to limit alcohol consumption. Healthy recommendations are actually no more than one drink per day for women and two per men, with a drink being five ounces of wine, a shot of spirits, or a 12-ounce beer. So not some of these like massive margaritas we can get when we go out to eat. That would some of those would probably be like considered two and three drinks. And so um, the other thing is if you feel like you need a nightcap to help you fall asleep, that to think about what some of these other topics are where you can't maybe <clears throat> change, make changes in those areas to help you um, with that, with that um, trouble you might be experiencing falling asleep. And so lastly, just talking briefly about portion sizes, and I know several folks had mentioned that um, in the chat so much, um, that we are, number one, not overindulging when we're presented with that buffet, but then on the flip side of that, that we're not under-consuming food um, for various reasons. Maybe it's intentional because we're dieting, or maybe it's we're just too busy um, and we didn't plan well to make sure that we had adequate meals and snacks with us throughout the day. So as a general rule, um, individuals need at least 1,200 calories per day to keep their body functioning. So that's like our base um, amount of fuel we need to put in our car to keep it running. Um, this number will be higher depending on your size or activity level. Um, and for those of you who might be restricting um, for weight loss reasons, I would just remind you that reasonable healthy weight loss is anywhere between a half pound to two pounds per week depending on your starting point, knowing that if you're making a lot of changes in the beginning, you're going to have that higher weight, weekly weight loss, and then it's going to kind of taper off, and you should expect to be more in that half pound per week um, weight loss range. And so I know we all want it to be that higher number, but the slow and steady weight loss is actually more likely to stay off. And so in the long run, um, it's better for you in multiple ways. And so the answer there is just to, to work with your family to plan your meals and snacks so that you always have those healthy options at hand and you're not stuck at the office or, you know, on the road if you travel without having um, healthy food with you and being tempted by those less healthy options. And so to summarize, a recap on this next slide... Um, just thinking about, about your drink options, again, limiting the caffeine and the alcohol, reaching more for water. Um, if you're not a big water fan, thinking about how you can zest that up, whether it's with um, a lemon slice, cucumber slices, mints. Um, and then thinking about um, your daily eating habits and how you can switch out those, those maybe less healthy more likely to make you have a, a slump afterward type snacks to something more, um, more sustaining. So for example, switching out the muffin for a yogurt with fruit and granola. And I'm going to stop here and scroll through the chat here real quick. Okay, I'm not seeing any questions, so let's keep moving right along then, Joe. So, at the beginning, um, several people said sleep. So, that is absolutely what we're going to talk about next. So, how many hours of sleep do you guys typically get in a night, do you think? Seven. Okay. Somebody's rocking it with seven. Seven, eight, six to eight. Last night, it was about three. <laughs> uh-huh. Yeah, I'm feeling you, Megan. So for those of you who are saying you're getting seven and eight, do you feel like that's good quality, restful sleep? Not as good as it can be. Okay. 
No, sometimes, sometimes it's restful. Yeah. So, um, if you want to pop up the next, um, yeah. So we want to shoot for seven to eight hours a night, but we want it to be restful. We want it to be tranquil. We want to be like this little fox here, sunning in the shade, so content and happy, his little tongue sticking out. So um, statistics will show us that less than 65% of people actually get the recommended seven to eight hours of sleep. Being chronically tired from insufficient sleep, as you all know, can wreak havoc on our bodies which kind of cascades. And if you recall back to the beginning of my presentation, that spider web. So you're tired, you start making unhealthy food choices, you're more stressed out, it's harder to think. It just all kind of rolls into one, right? Our brains are functioning at less than optimal levels. And so, and more so than that, when you're, when you're tired, you're less likely to feel motivated to do that workout, which is my next bullet point is physical activity. So less than 50% of adults meet the guidelines for aerobic physical activity. So the guidelines here are that we should be shooting for 150 minutes a week, which is about 30 minutes, five times a week of doing moderate to physical, moderate to vigorous physical activity, which means your heart rate is up high enough, you are breathing hard enough that maybe you could still have a really short clipped conversation with your exercise partner, but you're not going to be out there singing a song, right? You're going to be sweating a little, you're going to be breathing a little bit harder, at least five days a week. Um, and with that, and this is especially important, uh, well, it's important for everyone to get in those strengthening exercises. So when we build up that muscle endurance and that muscle activity, that is really what carries us through the day. Um, and it's actually exercise increase, not only increases our energy by increasing our brain activity, it is actually a key prevention tool for dementia. Um, and it stimulates a number of feel-good hormones, um, endorphins, serotonin, dopamine, etc. And if done regularly, the effects of exercise can extend far beyond those immediate effects um, into having lasting um, impacts on our mood and ability to um, combat stress. Um, and lastly, that regular exercise helps us relax, helps us reduce our stress, helps us filter out kind of those stress-induced hormones that could have been onset during the day and thereby improve our quality of sleep, our, improve our ability to fall asleep and stay asleep and actually wake up feeling rested. And lastly, um, rest and play. Let's not forget about having fun. So whether you're the kid on the beach having, playing in the sandbox or whether you just want to pretend you're a kid on the beach or whether you're going to break out your old roller skates. I was trying to find some really quirky things here to think about what we could do to bring out our inner child. Um, because there are, um, there is a significant amount of research that's coming out that shows that our need for healthy nutrition and physical activity is right up there next to our need to rest and relax and give ourselves a chance to just do nothing if that's what we find relaxing. And so with that, um, what should we do about our sleep? So number one, keep a bedtime routine. And that means even on the weekends, get going to bed and generally getting up at approximately the same time. Keeping our devices out of the room. I know our phones and our tablets, they have all these new like um, healthy behavior, like filters to change the light, keep out the blue light, et cetera. But I would still encourage you to just say, the bedroom is the bedroom. It's not the place for devices that if you, you know, read on your Kindle or on your phone that you're still doing that in another room. And that we are reserving the bedroom for bedroom activities, i.e. sleeping and cuddling. Shoot for those 150 minutes a week. Um, maybe you're tag teaming with a partner or um, a coworker on how you can challenge each other to get that um, physical activity in your day-to-day -day, um, activities. And then lastly, find, no, make time, make time for rest and play. 
and to do nothing at all if that's what your heart so desires. And so lastly, we're going to talk about health and mental health a little bit. So um, in a systematic review of 26 studies that looked at um, cases where a person's, a patient's primary complaint when they went to the doctor was tiredness. The most common, common underlying diagnosis of that tiredness was depression. With over 18% of cases, um, when, it, when it was in fact something diagnosable beyond just a behavior or the things that we've been talking about already up to now. So, um, tiredness is a primary concern, primary symptom, I should rather say, of disorders such as depression, anxiety, and chronic stress, which we have been all feeling um, in the last six months with chronic, in my mind, taking on a whole new, a whole new um, definition, right? So while other health conditions such as anemia, hypothyroidism, diabetes, and cancer only accounted for a combined total of 8%. Um, and then diseases such as chronic fatigue syndrome only occurred in less than 2% of patients. And let me back up and say this again. This, this, these studies were looking at patients who went to the doctor with their primary complaint of being chronically tired. Only 2% of them had a disease such as chronic fatigue syndrome. 8% of them had other um, various diseases such as anemia, diabetes, cancer, et cetera, where the overwhelming um, top diagnosis was depression or chronic stress that was not being addressed. And lastly, um, to kind of pull that all together, I would say that those who, di who were diagnosed with some sort of physical condition they found that these diseases did not necessarily occur in populations, in fatigued populations more than they occurred in non-fatigued populations. Meaning that these physical diseases in and of themselves was not an indicator that you should expect to be tired all the time. But even in these individuals, because when you have a chronic condition, especially you know, chronic fatigue, chronic pain, that in and of itself can become a risk factor and exacerbate any other stressors that might be in your life and can lead to anxiety and symptoms of depression. And so um, we will dig into this a whole lot more next week. Um, we're talking about stress in particular and, and what that does to the body and some things we can do both as self-help and if we feel the need to seek professional help. But what I would like to leave with you today is just to implore upon you to make time for yourself. And I did not stop and instruct you. I hope those of you who got your little pen and paper out that you were taking notes um, of things that maybe you identified one thing that you could do differently or that you could at least maybe think about and consider um, because change is hard, especially when we're in living in a whirlwind. But I would ask you to focus on, are you making time to exercise? Are you making time to allow yourself to go to bed on time at night um, without feeling like that one more thing has to get done? Because is it really going to matter tomorrow or two years from now? And so ultimately, are you making time for you? Do you like to go for walks? Do you like to read? Do you like to watch obnoxious, silly cat videos on YouTube? Nobody is judging you. If that's what makes you smile, then please do it. And lastly, I would just like to say that if you have tiredness that has been long-term and it interferes with your every day, to please see your doctor um, so that you can so that you can enjoy life to the fullest. Some say life that is, some say life is too short to miss out. I would say life is too long to live in discomfort and nobody, everyone um, deserves to live a long, pleasurable life. And so to, to kind of pull that all together, um, this last graphic that I put together, um,
Okay, well, we should have prefaced this. I think we did preface this by saying we're having some technical difficulties. So what I had was I had all those bullet points put together. So our sleep, our nutrition, our alcohol and caffeine intake, our, there it is, our inactivity, our stress. These double-headed arrows pointing from one to another is not really a true picture. If this was going to be a true picture, I would have a double-sided arrow drawing from each one of these to the other, and it would be a massive web just like I tried to show you on that first opening slide with the graphic of the spider web. You cannot impact one without impacting the other. Um, for example, if I choose to increase my physical activity, I'm getting direct benefits from that immediate increased energy from activating my body, but I'm also getting indirect benefits because it's helping me reduce my blood pressure, it's helping me lower my resting heart rate, it's helping me reduce my blood sugar levels and so on and so forth. It's also indirectly helping me by increasing the quality of my sleep, by increasing my hormonal regulation and reducing the stress hormones that could be um, pilfering through my body when I find out at 6 p.m. on a Sunday night that I don't have childcare for a week, um, you know, so and increasing my ability to cope with that stress, right? So, I would ask you, and you don't have to share, although I would be more than thrilled if you did, unmute and share or type in the chat box, but on your little sheet where you were taking notes, is there one thing in that list that you think you can pledge to do? Oh, definitely. We've got several people saying more physical activity. So my next step with that um, is for you to think about what that plan is going to look like. Because it's real easy for me to say I want to exercise more, right? I mean, we all say it to ourselves every day, and I'm no different. I just happen to be a health educator that has to confess that I don't always knock it out either. Um, but what are you going to do to make sure that you're able to do that? Does it mean putting it on your calendar? Does it mean getting your partner to help commit that they will watch the children for an extra 30 minutes while you have your you time? Does it mean that you're, you're gonna make a pact with your neighbor and you're gonna meet each other early in the morning so that you keep each other accountable? So just be thinking about what that's gonna mean. And this is true for everything, not just our physical activity. So once we say, I want to do this, what are the physical concrete things that you're going to put on place in place to make sure that it happens? And I would love to connect with you more about that. If you have questions, if you're like, Tanya, I have been trying for three years to figure out how I can fit more physical activity in my day. And I just cannot make it happen because my schedule is that. Well, you know what? Call me because that was just my story right there. And I don't know that I figured it out, but I've had, learned a few tricks along the way. So, um, well, Ed, with yoga, you know, there is true. It, it's, not, it's not always necessarily going to get your heart rate up, and we do want that 150 minutes of, of heart beating um, activity, but there is definitely that meditative state um, that we can get from yoga that can help help reduce our heart rate and, and keep us channeled as well. And so lastly, um, as I promised at the beginning of my presentation, we were going to ask you to complete a survey for us today. And so I'm going to drop this link in the chat box real quick. And it would very much benefit us from knowing um, your feedback and your comments on what not only what you thought of the content, but also the delivery method and what we can do to improve next time. And so while one person say sure on the deep breathing exercise. So if there's no more questions <laughs> or comments, we can do that. Um, another person said I would prefer the walk around the block. So you are more than welcome to log off. I will not stress out. Haha. -ha. If you leave me now, um, 
And we'll go ahead and um, try to calm down and get back for the rest of our day, okay? So I'm going to ask you to just find a comfortable position, um, seated, laying down if that's what you prefer if you're working from home, or if you have the ability to shut your office door. Just make sure you're comfortable. That's really what's important. Um, I invite you to close your eyes if that's comfortable for you. And just take a deep breath. And as you breathe in and out, just focus on deepening that breath, slowing it down. And as we continue this deep, slow breathing, just begin to think about any sensations you might be feeling in your body. Maybe aware of how slow or how fast your heart is beating. where you might be holding any tension in your body. And think about your face. Are you clenching your jaw? Release it. Relax your eyes. In your next exhale, think about your shoulders. Drop them down and away from your ears. Maybe roll your neck if that feels good. Next, think about your arms. Relaxing your elbow. <laughs> Placing your arms in a comfortable position where they can be completely relaxed, hands unclenched and open, ready to receive. With another deep breath in and out. And next, think about your back. Is it comfortable? Is it supported? Do you need to wiggle or adjust maybe to get a little more comfortable? And continuing with those slow, deep breaths, moving on down as you scan your body, thinking about your hips, maybe moving your feet out or moving them closer to your chair helps alleviate any pressure so that you're more comfortable. And then the same way as we move down our legs, thinking about our thighs, our upper legs, our knees, our calves, our ankles, rotating our feet first one direction as we take a deep breath in. And rotate them the other direction as you slowly breathe out. And just come back to a nice, comfortable position and take a deep breath in and out. One more time.
And if you had your eyes closed, go ahead and begin to flutter them open, readjust to the light, and think about if your body feels differently now than it did when we started. Hopefully you're feeling more relaxed. Maybe your heart rate feels a little bit slower. Maybe you feel like you could just lay down and curl up for a little nap, in which case I give you permission. And so with that, I will bid you a good day and just remind you that you can do that little activity anywhere. Um, if you have little ones, um, maybe not absolutely any time, but if you can teach them to do this with you, um, I know my three-year-old, it's a work in progress, but we can occasionally do the deep breathing together and it's, um, it's actually quite amazing feeling um, to get him to slow down and do that with me. So um, anytime you can find that moment to do that, either by yourself or with a partner, um, do that. There's plenty of, um, and we'll talk about this more next week, but there's plenty of um, videos on YouTube that can help you through the guided meditation as well that are anywhere from two minutes to an hour long. So um, with that, I would like to thank you all for attending. I hope to see you again next week as we take a deeper dive into kind of some of the stressors and what we can do day to day with deep breathing being one of those to help us feel a little less off kilter and a little more on balance. And so, um, Joe, did you have any final parting words to share then? Uh, no, other than I just want to thank you all uh, for being here and you all need to pat yourself on the back for doing something for yourself today because this was a self-care activity. You opened your mind to learn new information, to be open about something that you need some guidance on. Um, and we appreciate you being here and your willingness to share because we're all in this together. Hope to see you next.